responsibly, be respectful to other academics who are joining different parts of the world. For the Q&A session, we highly encourage you as we are do doing from yesterday, from the day one, we encourage you to post your question through Slido. You can scan this QR code or you can follow the link from the chat box that will be given later for this session. Now, whenever you are posting question for any of the speaker, please mention their name, which speaker you are referring to or your question is referring to. So for this session, I would like to introduce the moderator, Dr. Raymond Rastager. He is from the University of Queensland, Australia. He will be moderating the session and we'll take the question and answer at the end of the session uh, by the moderator and also your speakers. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, uh, Dr. Raymond. Dr. Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupam. Uh, good afternoon here in Brisbane, Australia. Good morning and evening from the you know, to participants from all around the world. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to be here today moderating this session on indigenous tourism. Uh, and I'm really happy to see the participations, the number here, and I'm sure we have many more people following us with via live streaming on YouTube. Being part of the organizing committee, I know how much time, effort, and number of people who have been involved in the last few months organizing this event. And I would like to, in particular, congratulate the team at Taylor's University of Malaysia for organizing this wonderful program. In the interest of the time, we are moving to introducing our great speakers for the session. Today, we have uh, three wonderful speakers, Dr. Professor Lizar Rouhanan, uh, Dr. Freya hagen sebiels and Dr. Puan Kunzakran from uh, Malaysia. Our first speaker for, the, uh, for today's session is Professor Lizar Rouhanan from the University of Queensland, Australia. Uh, Professor Rohanan is a professor in tourism and the director of teaching and learning with the UQ Business School at the University of Queensland. She has undertaken academic and consultancy research projects in Australia and overseas in the area of indigenous tourism, sustainable tourism, policy planning, and governance. Uh, Professor Rohanan has more than 100 uh, academic publications, and in 2017, she and the colleagues uh, created a book on indigenous tourism, the case from Australia and New Zealand. And if I'm not wrong, that was the first uh, book on indigenous tourism. I believe that's a very short introduction uh, for our first speakers, and the reason is because I had the pleasure of working uh, and knowing uh, our first speaker for a few, uh, for few years. Uh, and uh, Professor Rohanan is going to present on a very interesting topic today. She has brought a very uh, interesting question, actually. Indigenous people and the stages, can tourism be a meaningful enabler? So, uh, Professor Rohanan, we can't uh, wait any longer to hear the answer to that question. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Raymond. I uh, appreciate the um, kind introduction. I'm just going to begin um, to share my screen. And hopefully that's uh, showing there for everybody. Yes. yes. Great. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on, on where you're joining from. Uh, my name is Lisa Rohanan, as, as Ray said, and I'm from the University of Queensland um, here in uh, Brisbane in Australia. Um, I would like to uh, begin by um, uh, an, with an acknowledgement of country. Um, for those of you uh, not from Australia, um, this is something that we do uh, here in Australia to acknowledge that the lands that we are joining these meetings or conferences from um, uh, belong to uh, the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who were the native inhabitants or the original inhabitants of these lands. And so at the start of uh, important occasions such as this, um, we would acknowledge that um, the land that I'm joining you from today, so uh, Minjeriba in Brisbane, um, uh, belongs to the Yugara and Turrbal people, and I pay my respects and acknowledge their contribution to country um, 
and their elders. Um, I am a non-Indigenous Australian, third generation Australian, um, and so today I'm going to be talking about Indigenous tourism, but it, I would never presume or it would never be appropriate for me to talk um, about uh, Indigenous perspectives um, as a, as a non-Indigenous person. Uh, I have been very fortunate to work with many um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders predominantly here in Queensland, and I acknowledge those people um, today, Aunty Rhonda Apo um, from the Queensland Tourism Industry Council, Aunty Valerie Coombs um, from the Kwandamuka Yulaburabi Aboriginal Corporation, um, who I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of the work that they've been doing um, in this space. So in terms of the um, presentation that, uh, that I chose to focus on was around um, how tourism can be used to meaningfully um, address the SDG targets for Indigenous people. And so the 2030 Agenda does have some explicit statements around reducing inequalities and disadvantage um, that are faced by Indigenous peoples all around the world. And various Indigenous advocacy groups have, you know, ensured, um, sorry, endorsed uh, these recommend these suggestions, these recommendations, these goals and targets, um, and worked uh, to towards, with others towards ensuring that they very much focus on Indigenous people's development, but, you know, alongside things like human rights, equality and environmental sustainability. So one of the things I wanted to look at is just, you know, does tourism really have a role and what role can that be? And is tourism or can tourism play more of a role? Um, as I share my slides today, the images that I'm using are from various Indigenous or First Nations businesses here in Queensland um, as, as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the, the background and the issues um, before looking at a case of self-determined tourism development that some of my colleagues have been driving here in Queensland. So worldwide, the Indigenous population is estimated to be around 370 million or around 5% of the global population. But the Indigenous populations of the world account for about a third of the world's global poor and about 15% of the extreme poor. We know that Indigenous peoples represent a significant part of the world's cultural and linguistic diversity, heritage, unique knowledges, Indigenous knowledges are increasingly recognised um, as, as very important, um, where we've always, we well, we should have known that they're always important, but they are getting more acknowledgement for, for that importance. Um, around 65% of the world's land is under Indigenous customary ownership, but there's only a small fraction of that that's actually recognised as formally belonging to Indigenous peoples. In Australia, we have what we call native title, which is an incredibly long and arduous and difficult process for uh, descendants of the original inhabitants of the land to prove a legal claim to that land. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a, in a moment. But we know that Indigenous people continue to suffer social, economic and political marginalisation um, in all parts of the world um, and continue to suffer discrimination, extreme poverty, conflict. In Australia here, um, you know, a, a wealthy, developed country, um, indig the Indigenous population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, are the lowest socioeconomic group in society um, and most disadvantaged in terms of income, employment, education, imprisonment, child protection, health and wellbeing indicators, um, life expectancy and, um, and education, as I, as I noted. So just going back to to the SDGs and some of the points that were that resonated in in those aspects around Indigenous peoples and as I mentioned a lot of work was done by various advocacy groups to ensure that Indigenous voice in the goals, but there were well, and there have been some some further caveats. Um, I've got a quote here from the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, noting that some of the in, in achieving some of the other goals um, that these could pose risks for um, Indigenous peoples as, you know, maybe certain projects are encroaching on um, uh, lands and territories um, and that all of the goals should be attempted or, or, or any progress towards goals are done so that are really culturally sensitive and respecting Indigenous people's right to self-determination, um, but also land, health, education, culture and ways of living. 
The, uh, there's another quote here from the major group for Indigenous peoples and talking about, um, you know, some of the interpretation of the wording in the SDG goals. But there's one point there that I've highlighted that, that's quite important for us when talking about tourism development. It's around um, access or, or the rights or security of those, those land tenure rights, lands, territories and other resources that will be essential for poverty eradication. Um, we know that land is so important for Indigenous peoples, especially um, here uh, in where, where I am in Australia, um, but without that access to land, the ability to meaningfully address some of those poverty goals um, and, and other development goals are severely compromised. Um, there's, uh, again, a couple of quotes um, from uh, from. <clears throat> Indigenous leaders from around the world, again, talking about that importance of land and the, you know, the inherent connectedness of, of land to um, any opportunities for self-determined development. Um, and, you know, there's a, um, a quote, uh, the second quote there, that if if land is not part of that discussion, that access to land, um, it's, you know, it's really hindering any, any type of progress. So moving to tourism um, and, and, you know, what is that role of tourism? And we know that for many years in many parts of the world, here in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US and other places, um, governments have really looked to tourism as, you know, a, a unique opportunity for um, Indigenous peoples, First Nations peoples. Um, and it's been, you know, said that tourism can address a whole range of socioeconomic issues faced by Indigenous peoples. Um, you know, it can, uh, as we know, all the impacts, the positive impacts of tourism, you know, attracting investment, foreign currency, creating jobs um, and, and growing those host communities um, with the objective of leading to poverty reduction, sustainable development and other social enterprise goals. Um, we know that um, many tourism dependent communities or communities that have chosen to um, involve themselves in tourism um, have generated a number of, of positive impacts. And you can see there um, some around, uh, you know, sustaining that intangible cultural heritage, languages, stories, art, dance, hunting um, and, and other rituals and customs. So when we talk about Indigenous tourism, there's often, um, you know, with the, as we academics like to do, debate what, what this actually means, what it includes, what's in, incorporated. But generally, Indigenous tourism was referring to activities that take place um, on uh, by descendants of those from an occupied territory that were, you know, invaded, conquered or co colonised by white colonial powers. And so then the focus or the subject um, of Indigenous tourism then has emerged to be around those um, uh, of culturally differentiated people living in um, an occupied territory before the existence of that nation state, such as we have here in Australia, New Zealand uh, and elsewhere. Really important um, in those definitions or conceptualizations of Indigenous tourism is around Indigenous culture and identity, and that and that should be so central um, to any discussions or arguments or or, or any uh, you know any look towards Indigenous tourism. That's of course not always been the case, um, but but that should you know been so pivotal. The locus of control is also really important when we think about Indigenous tourism, that it, Indigenous uh, populations, First Nations people shouldn't be the, the focus that, you know, the part of the tourist gaze, they should be the um, really driving that, sharing that and not being sort of the subject um, or object that tourists are, you know, um, looking at. And so then it becomes inherent, in, sorry, inherent that Indigenous people are the ones controlling the way both tangible and intangible culture is portrayed and accessed um, through any type of tourism activity. So... We know, as I, as I mentioned before, um, there are many benefits and we have seen for this reason so many Indigenous communities choosing to, to um, embrace tourism. So that increasing awareness and appreciation of intangible cultural heritage, providing those opportunities for connection, discovery, um, 
opportunities to learn Indigenous languages. In some parts of Australia, Indigenous languages have, were, were extinct or almost extinct, and we've seen a real resurgence of those languages, given um, that in part, of course, there are other reasons. Tourism has really highlighted a focus on, on culture and uh, really uh, encouraged those um, sort of um, sharing those languages. Um, we, when we hosted uh, the Commonwealth Games here in the, on the Gold Coast um, a couple of years ago, there was a big focus on Indigenous language being uh, shared with visitors as part of that, which then was really important for the broader community, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to, to learn those languages. Other, other benefits there that for, for those of you that know tourism well won't be um, particularly surprised about, but I'm just mindful that I don't go over my time or Raymond will have to cut me off. Um, but in reality, we know that there, there are threats and we've seen that there have this has occurred in, in many places and led to cultural degradation, commercialisation, commodification um, of both tangible and intangible um, cultural heritage. Com uh, researchers um, have, have concluded that uh, or made statements such as that, you know, Indigenous tourism is really just upholding neo-colonialist attitudes. Um, some of the people I'm working with, uh, Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islanders here in Queensland, are talking about decolonising tourism as, as an emphasis in their development. Um, we see that many, many examples, and I, I, we see them here, regularly um, where Indigenous communities are still being told what is best for them, what they should do, what tourism should look like and on what terms. Um, so there's still that heavy influence by government and external authorities um, in driving that. And so what we see then is Indigenous tourism is being developed according to other, you know, non-Indigenous people's needs, wants, advice um, and the, uh, the host communities, the Indigenous people themselves are not necessarily getting um, a say in the direction and what that looks like, although certainly we've seen many improvements. One of the mechanisms that's been um, uh, relatively uh, quite useful um, in terms of some overarching principles, goals and, and things to work towards are the Larrakia, um, is the Larrakia Declaration on the Development of Indigenous Tourism. And I won't read through all this in, in detail, but just picking up on some things that these should be um, guidelines or, or, or were set to support self-determined economic development, um, recognising that these are principles that can support the development of Indigenous tourism. Um, in, and so you can see there things like customary law, again, that emphasis on land and water, traditional knowledges, cultural um, knowledge, um, uh, the second one there, again, talking about Indigenous culture and the land on which it's based is protected and, and um, promoted through tourism that Indigenous peoples are the ones to self-determine the types of organisational arrangements or institutional arrangements regarding tourism that they're entering into. Governments must um, consult, accommodate, respect Indigenous perspectives in making any decisions around um, tourism, the respect around intellectual property rights and the equitable partnerships between the, the tourism industry um, and Indigenous people. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. One of the cases before I finish, I just wanted to share with you, if I have time, Ray, I didn't keep a good uh, look. look yes, my... yes, we still have time. Okay, great, thanks. Um, one of the cases that I wanted to share with you is um, around uh, uh, a location very close to Brisbane here in, Queen, in southeast Queensland, um, and it's the island of Minjeriba, also known as North Stradbroke Island. And this is... Um, one of the uh, rare examples that we've seen here and well certainly in the part of the world that I am <clears throat> and certainly amongst some of the people that I've been fortunate to work with um, is uh, uh, so Minjeriba um, examples of the use of, of, of having access to land and then being able to drive that this sort of self-determined tourism development. Um, so through the Kwandamuka Yulaburabi Aboriginal Corporation, this is the native title. So the Kwandamuka people were um, uh, awarded their, uh, awarded would not be the, the right word, I think, um, their lands were returned to them um, after going through um, 
uh, a legal determination. And so for the last decade, so as you can see, that these lands were handed back on the 4th of July 2011. Um, and I just wanted to share some of the things that the Kwandamuka people through their um, organisation here, Kayak acronym for Kwandamuka Yulabarabi Aboriginal Corporation. I'll run out of time if I have to keep saying that in full. Um, some of the work that Kayak has been doing as, a, as an example of self-determined development. So they're very much focused on securing the Kwandamuka estate, securing the cultural heritage, protecting Kwandamuka Indigenous knowledges, um, and becoming economically self-sufficient. Um, they have a number of programs. Um, there's a photo on the, the, the left um, side of the screen there around Indigenous ranges. So the that Kayak are able to employ uh, local Kwandamuka people to work on country. These The country has been handed back to them. So they actually, uh, the Kwandamuka people have had about 98% of the island, this one island that's been returned to them. Um, there is some freehold, which so uh, residents that may may own a, a home there. Um, but so for the large part, the island is returned to the possession of the Kwandamuka people. So they're working for caring for country, their Indigenous fire management is, is able to be practised. Um, so there's a whole range of initiatives around care for country. The second one there is around cultural heritage and the Kwandamuka people have been able to put in place a really um, advanced um, system around protecting their cultural heritage. They have some control now over the, any developments that take place on their lands and the, the very careful considerations that must be put in place around um, uh, cultural uh, protection. Turning to tourism, I would argue, um, and I could be a little biased, um, that uh, Kayak have some of the most successful Indigenous-owned uh, businesses in Australia. They have um, Minjeriba Camping, um, which is uh, a number of camping grounds that they have um, taken, um, I was going to say, they haven't taken control over. They actually purchased them off the government that owned them previously, and they've turned these into exceptionally profitable um, businesses. They made great profits through COVID. Um, they have totally changed the, the model, introduced carrying capacity limits, um, limited undesirable visitors, for want of a better word, that were at odds with their uh, values and, and wants for the island um, and have been incredibly successful in growing this accommodation um, operation. They have recently been awarded native title on an, an adjoining island and they're about to start um, that same model of development there. But this is this is driven by Kwandamuka people. This is what the Kwandamuka people want. They uh, run, own, operate the entire facility. Um, and then Kwandamuka Coast, uh, a number of sort of so other tourism businesses, tours, um, and part of the work that I'm doing with Kayak is around their educational products and what the Kwandamuka people um, want to share and educate visitors on. Just going to conclude um, with uh, a couple of statements and returning to that opening question around, you know, what can tourism uh, be doing um, to help address the SDG targets for Indigenous people? And to answer this, I actually want to draw on some of the consultation that we undertook on behalf of um, First Nations uh, Tourism Council um, about a year or two ago here in Brisbane, uh, in Queensland, sorry. And, you know, in asking that question, I, I, as I say, I draw on those voices and, and how those respond would, would respond to that. And it was looking at, yes, tourism can make a meaningful contribution if there's recognition of traditional owners and that respect for connection to country, cultural protocols, traditional knowledge and intellectual property. The traditional owners of the land must be supported to develop the tourism products and experiences that they want on their lands, not that are, are imposed upon them from external bodies. Um, and to, that will allow or give a better chance to revitalize those, revitalize those cultural traditions, supporting and acknowledging the importance of reconciliation and that First Nations peoples or Indigenous peoples are engaged in genuine, meaningful partnerships that are driven by Indigenous peoples and they're not simply the subject 
<clears throat> of those. And that again, coming back to the importance of land, which has been reiterated at a number of times, um, is just so, so crucial um, to ensure that connection to country and offering the best chance of so, uh, opportunities to sustainably um, develop an economic sector for Indigenous people. Thank you, Ray. I'm going to leave it there and I hope I didn't take too much of um, time. Thank you so much, Lisa, for the great presentation and you were on time. I'm sure we'll have some questions and we'll come back to you at the end of this session. So we are now moving to our next speaker for today, uh, Dr. Freya Higgins-Tibulis. I'm not sure if Freya needs any introduction, just the name tells uh, a lot, uh, but I still do a very short introduction. I'm sure Freya will uh, excuse me for that introduction. Freya is uh, affiliated with the University of uh, South Australia, Swinburne University in Australia, Taylor's University in Malaysia, and University of Waterloo in Canada. Her work focuses on social justice, human rights, and sustainability issues in tourism. She has worked with industry, community, and NGOs for many years. She is the co-editor of Socializing Tourism, Rethinking Tourism for Social and Ecological Justice book, published in 2022, and the forthcoming book, A Local Turn in Tourism, Empowering Communities, which will be published later this year. Uh, Free is going to tell us today about uh, how centering local communities in uh, tourism. And I'm sure that would be a fantastic uh, presentation. Freya, over to you, and you would be glad to hear about your uh, topic and presentation. Thank you so much, Raymond. It's so lovely to be working with you today. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Sure. Okay, so I am very pleased to be here. And I'm honored to be in the session following Lisa with her expertise in Indigenous tourism. I am really appreciative that she laid some really good foundations for my talk. I will start with Indigenous uh, knowledges first, but I will move into a broader view about local communities and how they are important to tourism and also the attempts to secure some of the goals of the Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, my plan is to uh, discuss these things relatively quickly in the time I'm allotted about local and Indigenous knowledges. Then I'd like to ask a critical question of how do we know tourism? That opens up a question about centering local communities and how that might change how we understand and also manage tourism. And then I'll introduce the concept that I've been working on, on socializing tourism. And then that will bring me to some examples of what tourism looks like under local authority um, that we can currently identify at the moment. So in realizing this um, summer school, this CRIT summer school that we're attending that our focus is on innovation and technology to achieve the sustainable development goals, I would like to emphasize the fact that local and indigenous knowledges are actually sources of innovation and technology because of thinking that comes particularly from the West, which I would call white supremacy. We have not recognized indigenous and local knowledges as having innovation and technologies at the basis and that we might learn from them. So for instance, one analyst, um, Robin said, indigenous knowledge is technology. And we can see this in how some of the Western um, corporations, Western governments are turning to indigenous knowledges to solve some of our most modern problems. Um, for several decades now, pharmaceutical companies have been going through indigenous lands and speaking to indigenous communities because indigenous knowledges of plants um, for medicinal use are seen to be um, possible solutions to things like our cancer research. Here in Australia, uh, indigenous knowledges of land management here, for instance, can help with dealing with the dangers we have from climate change with out of control fires. So we're asking indigenous peoples to share with us their traditional fire burning practices. And then in terms of tourism specifically, there are explorations in the literature about 
local community and indigenous knowledges about how we could do tourism better. So one example out of Bhutan that's been known about um, publicized since the 1980s is the idea of the gross national happiness and how Bhutan has shaped and managed tourism with an emphasis on local community well-being, spiritual values, and creating and shaping tourism to local community uh, well-being. And up until very recently, our tourism knowledge has been very Western-centric, and fortunately, we're seeing this now change. So this takes me to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I just want to make this point that some analysts are saying the, uni the UN Sustainable Development Goals are universalizing, that they're trying to say that there's a one-size-fits-all approach to how we create a sustainable future. And so there is this problem with it that we need to question and critically analyze how do we localize them and make them meaningful in local places. And that's where my um, presentation is situated, is at this interface about localization. So I propose rethinking tourism. I have been teaching a course on tourism planning for a number of years. Some of my best thinking has come off of my teaching. And I conventionally taught the definition of tourism at the beginning of this course, that we understand tourism by the nature of the businesses that supply products and services to the tourist, and then those serving to meet the motivations, the demand of the tourist. And when we put those together, we've got the tourism system of tourism supply meeting tourist demand. But it always troubled me because my interest was the local communities and they become invisible in this definition of tourism. If we think about local communities, we call them host communities and they're one among many stakeholders if they're noticed at all. In the perspective of the tourism businesses supplying products and services to tourists, what we see is the businesses could be seen to be the host. They're the ones serving and catering to the tourist. And that's a real problem in this view that the local communities are invisible, invisibilized in this, even though we do call them the host community, whether they want to be or not. And in my view, and in the recent work that I've been doing, this may be a source of a lot of the problems in tourism. And I think the fact that the local community's rights, needs, and benefits from tourism are often not evident. And that's where you get local opposition. And we think about before the pandemic hit us, the major cities of Europe, such as Venice and Barcelona, where there's been protests, there's been um, graffiti uh, that's been publicized by the media and so on. And we might think about Derrida's idea of hospitality, um, where the host are not so happy and there's a hostility sitting underneath it. And it's because the uh, terms, the conditions of hosting have not been properly addressed as it's the industry and the tourist that have been emphasized. So in thinking this through in 2019, uh, together with some colleagues, we proposed a community-centered framework for tourism, which centers this local community at the heart of the definition of tourism. And what we proposed is if we did this, if we centered the local community rather than the tourists or the businesses, then we reshape the whole of the phenomenon. And this model is meant to get to the heart of that. So we see that in particular, tourists need to change from de demanding consumers to guests that need to follow uh, protocols that the local community sets for them. That governments should be concerned to involve local communities in the decision making around tourism and to have them involved in planning and implementation that tourism businesses need to secure a social license to operate that comes from serving the local community and ensuring that they gain benefits and don't just wear the negative impacts of tourism. And then lastly, what we call destination management organizations or destination marketing organizations and industry associations need to shift their mindset to serving communities and to working towards the public good in tourism rather than just maximizing profits for the business owners or for the shareholders if it's a big corporation. So this would be a way that we could reshape tourism 
to better serve communities and ensure justice occurs. And in my view, it's a foundation for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's much more sustainable um, in terms of local communities benefits from tourism. We need to transition to such a situation because we've been told that tourism is an industry and very much emphasized its economics where we think about the foreign exchange, the employment, um, the jobs and income, the infrastructure um, that it helps build in, in communities that are uh, hosting tourists. So in order to transition to this local community-centered tourism, uh, we need to socialize tourism. And that's some thinking that I've done, uh, again, with a few colleagues about what this might mean. How do we reshape tourism to coming up with this mindset of serving the public good for local communities? So the meaning of socializing tourism is to make tourism responsive and answerable to the society in which it occurs. And at its heart, it is about ensuring local communities' rights in decision-making, rights to benefit from tourism, and that they are at the center of tourism. And at this point, I'll just say what this photograph's about. This is in the heart of Adelaide in the CBD at one of the spirit festivals. Um, the spirit festival, uh, sorry, it's the French festival in Adelaide. The French festival opening uh, involves Garner traditional um, custodians of Adelaide and the performance. And so this was by Carl Telfer and his dance performance group. And uh, you see the totems of the Garner people um, in this uh, artwork that's shown at the festival opening um, at the SA Museum in Adelaide. So this is socializing local people going to this beautiful festival in the festival state to say Garner custodians are here, Garner custodians are connected. And for you to enjoy this festival, you can sense it differently by engaging with our custodial um, connections to this place, which still continue. And why do we need this? Well, we need to return back to this idea of tourism being profoundly unsocial as it has emphasized the business side, the industry side which has led to some unsocial activities. We can see this in the stories that we hear about disrespectful behavior. Uh, we particularly see this, I think, off of the impacts of the technologies of social media, which encourages sort of selfishness and narcissism. And you can think about the stories, uh, people um, getting naked in inappropriate places, which happens all around the world and it upsets uh, religious and sacred sensibilities of people. There are particular forms of tourism that, that may be more unsocial than others. Uh, child sex tourism is easy to put in that category, which is a phenomenon we don't often talk about, but which does exist. Sex tourism can be seen to be exploitative. Slum tourism, when you go to gawk on people who are less fortunate than yourself, again, that's another form which can be profoundly insensitive. Then we might think in thinking about unsocial tourism, the negative impacts of tourism. When we talk about tourism in local communities and indigenous peoples, we need to recognize tourism dispossesses people. It has indigenous uh, peoples around the world historically, uh, but even today there are dispossessions, for instance, of people that live in beautiful coastal areas from the beaches to create gated beach resorts. Then we have the poor jobs, um, the poor pay, the poor conditions, precarity in tourism jobs, and that's become spotlighted by the pandemic. Tourism dependency has also been spotlighted. Places like Bali, some of the Pacific Islands, have come to realize how their economies are distorted to become tourism dependent and how that leads to vulnerabilities. There are also wider structural injustices the tourism industry is set up for the benefits of major corporations in some cases, and they have the capacity uh, to control or at least very strongly influence governments to give them subsidies, tax um, exemptions, uh, and this means that the local communities don't benefit from tourism. This is some of the problems with things like Airbnb and Barcelona. 
And then, of course, that term overtourism that we've heard about from maybe 2017, it became strongly into focus, which is connected to some of these very things that I'm talking about. So these are some of the aspects of what we're trying um, to combat. So in talking about this idea of socializing tourism and centering the local community, uh, Bobby Bigby and I have talked about what this local community might mean, and it means not only the local people, but it also means the local ecology, all of the beings in place. And it means all the generations, because when we think about sustainability, we should be thinking about future generations. That's part of the aspect of sustainability. So we need to take these into account when we're shaping tourism um, for the well-being of local, local communities. That involves local communities benefiting, benefiting from tourism, having decision-making power, but also importantly, the right to say no. And then we should think about tourism also involving local community as tourists, as local recreationists to enjoy their places and that they can experience some of the benefits of tourism as well. So in talking about this um, idea of localizing tourism, I wanted to bring a few examples. And I think this book uh, that was published in 2019 by Duke University Press called Detours, which is an edited volume, which is called A Decolonial Guide to Hawaii, is one of the best contributions that I've seen. And it argues throughout the book with several examples about understanding the right of access to place to local communities is when you follow the understood protocols of place. Permission may not always be given. Um, you do need to ask. Um, but you will not be granted necessarily per permission to visit all places because places are reserved for those places that people have the custodial rights um, to protect and care for. And then it talks about the fact that these forms of tourism that it's encouraging are learning journeys and they're about encounters that change people and you need to be open to what that place has to offer you. So it's a very rich understanding of tourism, which I would call tourism being guided by local authority. Other examples, I think Julia Albrecht is writing about this recently in some of her work about uh, local, uh, sorry, tourism pledges as local pledges. This could be seen as tourism under local authority. The Palau Pledge is one example, and on the um, right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the stamp that goes in passports of visitors to Palau. The pledge was written by the children of Palau, and it says, um, we want you to be respectful visitors. You can look at Leary um, Tourism, which is in Arnhem Land in Australia, an Aboriginal enterprise, and their guiding principles are really invaluable for understanding assertions of local authority for tourism. And then another one from Canada, the Haida Gwaii Pledge is another beautiful one. And it talks about the Haida Gwaii uh, requiring respect for people and place when visitors come. So we can see that respect is the underpinning value. And it's about responsibilities then. If you have respect, then you have responsibilities to the local people and to the local place. And then about relationships that then come off of that. And then, of course, if the tourists are not respectful or if the industry is not respectful, then we turn to community activism. And I've been watching the cruise tourism space very closely. And the two images on the screen here are from community activations against cruise tourism, particularly against the large mega cruise ships that visit, one from Norway on the left and the other from Key West in Florida on the right setting um, information for cruise ship visitors who come off the ship to understand the impacts of their cruise visits on the community and asking them to be knowledgeful and aware of the impacts they're having and that maybe that cruise ship's not the most sensitive way to come. Um, so these are examples of, again, local authority over tourism. So this has been a quick run through of information. How might this knowledge guide us in thinking about tourism? The image that I have here actually goes back a very long time ago from Kangaroo Island when I was doing research over there. And students in a local, I think it was um, middle school, what I would call middle school, had created posters saying, we don't want tourism to overdevelop 
on Kangaroo Island in South Australia. So again, young people, local young people saying, we want visitors, but we don't want you to change our home. So there is wisdom to be gained from local uh, people living in place. Universalizing tourism forces are a problem, and I think the solution or a solution is to localize. Placing tourism under local authority is one way to tap local wisdom for tourism so that it operates the best that it can. And you could think of uh, Professor Lisa's case study um, that she just presented to you as a great example. And then additionally, we should be bringing in diverse knowledges from the local community and listening to many uh, people from the community, including women, elders, youth, um, queer uh, views, and then more than human views. And I'll just quickly say why I say more than human. There are legislation now happening about the rights of nature. So for instance, the Fanganui River in New Zealand, Aotearoa, um, now has rights with the local iwi speaking for the rights of the river. So when we think about these things of local, we need to think about uh, local nature, uh, more than human beings within an environment. And then for the conclusion, what I would like to say is, you know, tourism is about jobs and income. When people engage in tourism, it is because it's an economic activity. But that doesn't negate the fact that it's also a power, powerful social force and it connects people. So that is what we could tap by making the local community the center of the phenomenon. Tourism brings people together, particularly as host to guest, hosting guests, but it is also about power. So we need to think about this idea of protecting local places as we have environmental difficulties. Centering the local community is one approach to this. I think socializing tourism describes processes that could help us reframe and rethink tourism away from exploitation. And there are values that we could recognize and harness and enhance that would help us um, make tourism more sustainable, that moves more forward than a universalizing um, techno-scientific economic approach would do with tourism. And the image on the uh, left side of the screen is the book that we're excited will be coming out, an edited volume with some really great contributions that helps us think through both the good things about what we call a local turn in tourism some of the pitfalls, of course, because communities are not ideal. Um, nothing is ideal. Um, so thinking through how we might harness this to help reach sustainability. And um, I'll just show you there are references for this PowerPoint that you can follow through. And I'm really grateful for the time. Raymond, I hope I've done OK. Thank you so much, Freya. You're on time. And uh, like always, a great presentation. I should say personally, I have learned a lot from your work. And it's always good to see how you are encouraging us to have this critical thinking about everything that's happening around us. Thank you so much, Freya. We'll come back to you with questions. So now you are moving to our next uh, speaker for the day, last speaker, Dr. Kwan. We are really happy to have you on board, especially because you are going to provide us with this perspective from you know, another part of the world. Dr. Puan is a senior lecturer at the Department of Social and Developmental Sciences, University of Kutra, Malaysia. He obtained his PhD in the field of community development from University of Kutra, Malaysia. His research mainly focused on community-based tourism, indigenous tourism, and sustainable tourism practices. He's also an honorary treasurer of uh, Asian Tourism Research Association and visitor professor at Philippines University, LPU. Uh, and he has been involved in different projects on working on community development and indigenous uh, uh, tourism in Malaysia. He's going to tell us about crystallizing sustainability for indigenous tourism, the case of Orang Asli in Malaysia. So I'm sure that would be a great presentation and case study. Dr. Puan, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Raymond, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'll share my screen now. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you.
So good afternoon. Uh, thanks still morning in Kuala Lumpur. Hi everyone, and uh, thanks to Crete uh, for inviting me again this year uh, to deliver uh, this interesting uh, topic uh, on indigenous tourism. I would like to uh, bring in some ideas on crystallizing uh, what is sustainability from the perspectives of the indigenous people themselves. Okay. So the, we've seen the goals, uh, we are well versed uh, on the well-established goals 2015 to 2030. And uh, we see chronologically these goals initially uh, from 1972 Stockholm conference to Brundtland 1987 and millennial development goals. And now we have these SDG goals uh, originally from environmental perspective now towards uh, community, people and uh, equality. However, uh, if, whether we achieve this is questionable. So our main intention um, is to empower the communities uh, to provide them equal opportunities. Uh, grassroots involvement is needed. And uh, I believe uh, Professor Lisa Rohanan also mentioned uh, about this. Uh, indigenous people uh, should be seen as subjects and not objects uh, within, this, within this tourism spectrum. And a little bit on uh, the theme of the session on community-based tourism. So what, what is community-based tourism? It's a particular type of tourism where the ownership is given to the community. They are empowered to run tourism business. They directly or indirectly participate in tourism businesses. And uh, if, you, if you could uh, see this uh, classification by Hinch and Butler, uh, there are various types of involvement, various levels of involvement of people, indigenous people uh, in tourism. Okay. The preferred one is, of course, uh, when the indigenous uh, team is present and the people control their business. However, uh, that's not the case for most of the communities. As you can see some of the communities, they own tourism business themselves and they portray or they sell their culture. Uh, at some other places, uh, especially if you see like the Red Indians, um, the Mohican Pequet uh, Indigenous Casino, where they, they, are, they are not at the highest level of portraying their culture to the outsiders. Okay, so this can be matched with uh, Einstein uh, letter of participation uh, to, to measure where uh, the indigenous people can be located, plotted towards their involvement in tourism business. And uh, talking about indigenous people, um, there could be a little bit confusion on uh, whether they are indigenous, aboriginal, or native. And basically, uh, these are decided by the geopolitical perspective. Okay, uh, as, as mentioned here, indigenous, the word indigenous was first used officially by UN in 2002. Okay, and in India, the are Adivasis. In China, they are Uyghurs, Zhuang, Hui, Indonesia, Masyarakat Adat, and uh, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait uh, Island, Islanders in uh, Australia and Malaysia, we have Orang Asli and uh, so on. And uh, this was, I will skip this, uh, was uh, explained by the first speaker earlier, a uh, very significant incident um, to tell the world what is the expectation for, of, the part, of particular, this particular community particular minority communities most most of the country okay? they would want to be given, given equal partnership they would want to be respected okay? and uh, yes it is a money making industry okay economically beneficial industry okay however whether the income from tourism industry channeled directly to the community is questionable as well. If you look at uh, uh, the recent uh, 
SDG report. It was in June this year. Okay, uh, I just selected some of the goals relevant to the community. It will take another uh, four more years, right, uh, to to achieve a certain level of uh, poverty eradication. Okay, this is due to COVID, and we also have uh, uh, the Ukraine Russia crisis here, right, and. Uh, it, it will create more inequality and uh, and there are other goals highlighted okay not doing well okay if you look at uh, gender equality okay, it will take another 40 years for women and men to be represented equally in leadership and if we can reflect or if we can integrate these or indigenous tourism perspective, it could be even worse because uh, most of the indigenous people belong to the low income category in various parts of the world. And uh, United Nations actually came up with this recovery guide specifically on social cultural impact uh, COVID-19. Um, focusing on indigenous communities, uh, realizing the, the need to empower them. Okay? Uh, there's a need for from assisting to enabling them enough of giving uh, uh, start to empower okay? and strengthening skills and building capacities and uh, uh, strengthening digital literacy among the indigenous people. I will show you some of uh, empirical uh, data from Malaysia later. Acknowledging the uh, acknowledgement is very important, right? Uh, of indigenous people for mutual respect. And uh, can we attain sustainable indigenous tourism uh, when we are currently in this particular spectrum? Okay, ethics, social elements, cultural elements are controlled by. Uh, economic uh, drive um, and if you can read the recently released uh, SDG scorecard report uh, some of the goals related to industry or infrastructure development are doing well okay. uh, as opposed to the goals relevant to poverty and equality and this is of course what is desired okay. social cultural elements and ethical elements to guide us towards achieving our economic, economic motive or goals. And uh, orang asli's in Malaysia, the indigenous people of Malaysia, okay, uh, there are 18 sub-ethnic groups, three main groups, and uh, there are some other indigenous people living in the Borneo Island, Sabah and Sarawak okay, of Malaysia. So I would like to uh, explain or introduce four communities and the issues that they face uh, for tourism. Uh, the Mahmari people of Kerry Island, uh, closer to Kuala Lumpur, okay, uh, they are well, they are a well-established community to run tourism. However, the issue is uh, cultural commodification. Uh, okay, they, they feel after some time, they feel that their culture is dominated by somebody else. Okay. Whether whatever they do is staged authenticity is it's not purely it's not authentic, okay. And some of the reasons given given by the some of the output from the community, uh, this is interesting. Okay, this is sustainability from their perspective. Okay, yes, our income is not consistent. Okay, I always thought I was from this particular guy. Uh, I can quit this and go to work. In another industry, no, I won't quit. Even if I don't get any profit, I will still do tourism. Why? You don't get any income from tourism. Why do you want to still get involved? My Moyang, Moyang or ancestor, came into my dream and advised me not to leave tourism. Okay? I was advised to, to carry, to, 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 to portray my culture to outsiders or to the next generation. So this makes the community to still be in tourism. Okay? And uh, there's an issue of a spoon feeding. Okay? Uh, 
some communities are given too much by the by the government and that's not what they want okay? a lot of money spent on uh, interpretation center and uh, facility development which the rural community or this is but the particular indigenous communities wouldn't want to um, uh, use these particular facilities because they want to be as authentic as possible and uh, another community uh, Olders in Malaysia, Negritos in Royal Balloon, uh, the state of Para. Accessibility is an issue um, and empowerment is an issue there. Okay. We are uh, always invited for opinion in tourism development plans. When we see the final plan, none of our ideas are considered. Uh, this is a common issue, uh, I believe, even in the literature as well, I highlighted by various researchers. Okay they are not equally given opportunity to make decision. Okay. And uh, genuine participation, we have strong culture and good environmental knowledge. Not all the members of the community would want to involve in tourism. Uh, there's not enough participation from every member of the community of this particular uh, Negrito people in Malaysia. Okay. There's a need for nature guide, but not everyone would want to involve in tourism but they have a very good source of indigenous knowledge. Okay? And uh, community capacity, uh, we have indigenous tour packages. It was, pre it was prepared by an outsider, not us. Okay? He promotes this village, he brings in the tourist. Uh, we are very grateful that we are still getting the tourist market because of the outsider. However, we only get paid a bit from our dance performance. If we can get paid directly from the tourists, we can earn better living. This is another issue. Okay. And the community capacity is not at a, at a desired level. Uh, outsiders uh, take that advantage. And uh, the Palau uh, people of Borneo, uh, stateless people, uh, basically they do tourism not to earn money or sell their or portray their culture, but it's at a survival mode. Okay. The local people don't buy from us. Okay. We expect only tourists. Okay, if I don't sell this coral crab, my family will not eat today. And they just live here on this boat. They don't have a place to stay. Okay? Basic education, we want to do tourism. They are interested, but we don't have basic education. Uh, it's not possible. Formal education is not possible uh, for them because they don't have proper documentation. They don't belong to Malaysia or the Philippines. Okay. We, do, we don't know many things, we don't have phone, we don't know how to read, but we want to do tourism, that's the intention. And uh, the last one, uh, Dayak women in Borneo, in Sarawak, uh, on, on women empowerment or disempowerment. This was just very recent, two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, according to the community, uh, women empowerment, uh, I do tourism myself. I do tourism business myself. Last week, I managed to secure seven buses of tourists from Kalimantan to, this is from Indonesia, Kalimantan to Sarawak. Okay. However, we still don't have good communication negotiation skill, but we are willing to learn. Our main aim is to tell people about our culture. Money is next. So if you see along the, along the way, uh, I'm emphasizing that economic benefit is not the main agenda of indigenous people in Malaysia to run tourism. And uh, maybe if we could consider this by Professor Berto Gomez, a social anthropologist, uh, and uh, he, he uh, highlighted this particular model, alternative social ecology model, as opposed to uh, maybe the, the traditional sustainable development model. Uh, and uh, if you can see, uh, this model can be replicated for the indigenous people and also for the mainstream uh, communities. Right? Equality, peace, and sustainability is just a subset of the whole ecological model. Right? And uh, the conclusion that we can make here is uh, the communities, uh, indigenous communities are not given a fair opportunity. Okay? To voice out their views. Okay. They are invited various occasions to uh, you know, for the opinions, 
However, towards the end, decision making is done by outsiders. And this is not, it, this could not be the same for other indigenous communities in the world. Uh, uh, but in, in Malaysia, okay, this is uh, uh, quite common. And uh, the roles and contribution of women in rural areas were consistently ignored. And uh, so sustainable tourism development is possible. Uh, it is possible. Sustainability uh, is not an output. It's a process. So it's possible. So the moment sustainability is seen as an outcome, it is almost a difficult task to achieve. So uh, for indigenous people, uh, I'd like to suggest if sustainability seen as a process, okay, whereby uh, community resources, which they already have, should be strengthened with community development, capacity building, self-reliant uh, perspective, and uh, uh, of course, empowerment towards the end, which could lead us to uh, sustainable indigenous tourism. Uh, the main reason is uh, we always uh, concentrate or focus on the mainstream tourism businesses, the hotel and uh, hospitality from the uh, commercialization point of view. Indigenous people also belong to the tourism chain and system. With that, uh, I would like to end my uh, degree. Uh, over to you, Dr. Raymond. Thank you so much, Dr. Puan. It's fascinating to hear about uh, the cases of your community-based tourism in other parts of the world and how they are facing different issues and what's happening. Thank you so much for the great presentation. And I'm sure there are many questions now, So, but because of the interest of the time, you're just focusing on uh, uh, maybe asking a couple of questions from each presenter. And uh, then uh, I can promise that we are passing all other questions to the, our speakers. So hopefully you can follow up with these uh, conversations. So if you allow me, I will start with uh, our first uh, presenter, uh, Lisa uh, Rouhanan, Professor Rouhanan. Uh, Professor Rouhanan, uh, there is a question here. First, uh, thank you and says, uh, you refer to land ownership or how the land was returned to indigenous people. Can you please explain what do you mean by this process and whether this creates any conflicts with other organizations like maybe Department of Environment or Natural Resources or how these communities are managing or indigenous people are managing the land? Sorry for the long question. <clears throat> Thank you, Raymond, and, and thanks for that question. Um, yes, I, I appreciate in talking about this. It was it was a, quite an Australian-centric view, and uh, I'm not sure how prevalent it is in other parts of the world where everyone may be joining from. So uh, I was referring to native title, um, and uh, a couple of decades ago, we had the first native title claim in Australia, and it was basically recognising that when the English arrived in Australia, that there were people living here because when the English colonised or settled Australia, um, they termed the land uh, terra nullius, which meant there was empty land, there was nobody here. Um, and so the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders for more than 200 years have fought against that to say, um, no, actually we were here. Um, and uh, the, the first case we had of, of native title, which was where the federal government or the Commonwealth government formally legally recognised that, um, the, that the, the lands were originally inhabited. And so uh, this is a, a, a exceptionally complicated process. Some of these claims can take one, uh, 10 years, 20 years to, to, to prove. Um, and, and it's basically the onus is on the uh, descendants, uh, the, the traditional owners, to prove that their families or their, um, their extended families had some sort of connection to that country. Um, yes, it can um, cause uh, conflicts. Um, the uh, system is a, a little better in terms of, say, relationships with 
you know, environmental bodies, native parks. Um, from my understanding, yes, there can at times um, be conflict um, with the non-Indigenous population as well, um, where we've seen native title claims. There's often a lot of fear about what that means. You know, will, will my house be taken away from me? Um, uh, it's, it's not the case, but it, it can cause some um, uncertainty. Sorry, native title is something that someone might talk about uh, for four years and a whole degree, and I've tried to very badly talk about it in about one minute, so. Thank you so much, Lisa, for uh, answering that question. There are many other questions I'm just trying to summarize and ask the key question. It seems there are lots of interest around the case you presented, and uh, uh, people would like to know if there is any lessons that can be probably learned from that particular case study. Um, and how it can be probably transferred or applied to other cases, even outside Australia. They, they are interested to know if there is anything, probably in particular, that you can probably provide examples from the case study. I think there's a couple of key measure, uh, key facts that factors that make this a well a successful or a relatively successful case. One was the land ownership, as I mentioned. What the Kwandamuka people have been able to do would have been very hard to do without being awarded their lands back. So if they if they didn't have that that access to land, um, the the more transferable aspects would be around that. Uh, <laughs> That determination to be self-determined, that, that that's a was a very strong driving factor um, and, and very strong, passionate advocates who work tirelessly um, to, to make to, to have so many activities and, and initiatives happening. I think of in, yeah, that would be my, my main uh, sort of suggestion in terms of that the transferability. The strong champions who really want to make something happen. They have a great product. They're very um, savvy in terms of understanding what the market wants, but they're not compromising what they want to get that. They um, are very, you know, they've reduced their capacity. People were outraged that they couldn't go to their favourite place to for their, their summer holidays, and, and they made no apologies for it. Um, and they had a good product, so they didn't have to. They didn't have to, you know, make any apologies, really. They won in the end. Thank you so much, Lisa, for answering that question. There are many other questions, but I have to apologize that we do not have time to you know, discuss all those. But again, I promise to pass them to, to Lisa and then you can follow up. We are moving to our next speaker, Dr. Freya. Uh, Freya, again, there are lots of questions around the term you introduced in your presentation, especially along, uh, sorry, around the local authority. People are interested to know about particular SDGs that are set at the global level. They would like to know, especially because you discuss um, this idea of you know, local turn, how this global set at the global level, uh, this agenda, sorry, is different to what we can see in contemporary tourism. I know you answered this question in some way in your presentation, but it would be good if you can probably explain it, probably describe it a bit more. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure if I got that, Raymond, so redirect me if I'm not answering the question properly, but we have this possible disconnect between the universalizing global SDGs and then what happens at the local level. And what I'm hopefully arguing effectively is that local knowledges and local capacities could actually shape sustainability for best outcomes in local places. So for instance, to give an example, um, we have SDGs on uh, the marine environment. I'm not, I don't remember exactly which SDG it is, but we've got on water and on land um, SDGs. And it's indigenous knowledges and local knowledges of how to live sustainably with marine ecologies that could help in local places, for instance, managing fisheries or ensuring that um, the marine animals are cared for and that they're not displaced by tourism developments. So for instance, turtle nesting um, sites and so on. And if we ignore those local um, knowledges, those local traditions, um, local capacities uh, to protect marine environments, then what we get are universalizing agendas that will miss the point. So that I think is a really important um, insight to have. 
It doesn't solve all our problems around sustainability. We still need global efforts and global agendas, but I think that it's really important to understand that it's global and local together that will lead to effective change. And I think it's local communities that have that localized knowledge. Thank you so much for, your, for answering that question. There is another question, uh, again, asking about, you know, this term socializing tourism, which uh, this person believes is a very great idea. Uh, but the, the question is how we can think about, you know, implementing the idea when we are moving to less less developed countries or less democratic, you know, regions. So how we can speak about, you know, local authority or local power in tourism? Okay. Well, we do know that in, in the global situation that we've got a problem with uh, reasserting nationalism, uh, possibilities of authoritarianism happening. And my argument would be those are political reasons that's happening because of crises and insecurities and particularly climate change uh, pressures, I think will be conducive to those authoritarian ways of doing things. Um, that still doesn't mean that there's not local mechanisms to assert local knowledges. Um, and, you know, democracy uh, is a concept, it's kind of a nebulous concept. We've got different kinds of democracies. We've got different kinds of authoritarian regimes. And it's about this ability of local peoples to connect and engage uh, with the management in their local places. Tourism has to operate in these different diverse contexts in which it happens. So I think, you know, that's that's a problem. You know, if you look at a place where there's conflict happening, hot conflict violence happening, then of course, local contributions to decision making are unlikely to happen. And that brings us to that idea. I like that alter, alternative um, philosophy that uh, our last speaker gave us about this idea of looking at the connections between peace, ecology, and equality. I think that's what the model was talking about. How do we make these things possible in all the different contexts? Um, because obviously we're not all going towards um, that ideal of democracy. Um, and yes, uh, local people have to stand up for um, their ability to express their needs and their rights within these contexts. I don't think I've satisfactorily um, solved that one, but you know we can do this together. That one's going to be an ongoing issue. Thank you so much, Freya. Uh, great answer. And uh, again, I have got many questions here, but the, because of the interest of the time, I have to move to the next speaker. But uh, I will definitely pass these questions to Freya. So Dr. Puan, um, there's a question here for you. You introduced or you mentioned the problem of stage authenticity in one of these communities. Uh, what do you think about, you know, how to address this issue in the case of uh, Malaysian communities? Because in uh, one way, communities wants to definitely benefit from tourism, so get involved in the business. But then we have this issue of commodifications. Uh, what do you think about, you know, probably solving this problem? That's the question. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. I think uh, state authenticity is uh, this high correlation with economic uh, gain from there. Uh, for example, the community that uh, work with, uh, they, they used to do wood carving from message from the ancestor. They don't simply do wood carving. Okay. Uh, it's the existence of tourism, tourists in their area, when the tourists come in, can you do uh, something like Cristiano Ronaldo? So they take the order. Okay, can you do my face? Can you do a mask, which you know that I prefer? Uh, uh, so that is very much staged. That is not authentic. However, for tourism, um, they do, right? So uh, some community members raised concern, especially the younger ones doing wood carving, uh, into this staged authenticity. Uh, they don't adhere to the norms of the community. You do wood carving only when there is a message from ancestor. So there's conflict there. So how to solve this? 
it is quite difficult. They are already into this, right? However, can control by um, educating the next generation of uh, the community members, okay, to uh, at least insert some values of their community uh, when they do wood carving or their traditional dance to portray some uh, good values to the outsiders. Thank you, thank you Dr. Juan, for the answer to this question. I have got another question which somehow is uh, related to the first question. Uh, someone is asking about the uh, government intervention in tourism development in these countries because to this person it seems that countries like Malaysia, the government might be a more powerful stakeholder. And what do you think about the role of government? Do you think uh, if government, uh, like a government intervention, is helping with the, you know this problem of authenticity, or it's making it worse? I think uh, the government through the Ministry of Tourism is doing well in highlighting uh, the communities with uh, good prospects of tourism development. They are doing well. However, there's missing link where uh, to match what actually the community wants. Sometimes, as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, right, uh, the, de the, the facility development, infra infra infrastructure development, okay, uh, determined by not looking into what the particular community want or considering the decision by the community. It is just developed for the sake of development. And uh, matter of fact, some communities wouldn't want development, right? For them, development is ecological development, not economic development. So all these should be considered uh, when governments um, would want to develop a particular community for tourism. If they want economic benefit, okay, uh, this is the type of plan that you can we can consider. Uh, if you want other type of development, you are very much into environment, okay, why not do this, right? Uh, wildlife tourism or indigenous tourism rather than ecotourism, right? So that could be a way. Thank you so much for the answer to this question. Again, very good uh, conversation hearing that, uh, you know, from all our uh, speaker today. And I apologize again if you didn't have time to ask all these uh, questions, but I would like to thank everyone who posted their questions. It was really good to have this conversation here. So we are now moving to providing a summary of uh, today's session. We started the session on indigenous tourism by our first speaker, Dr. Um, Professor Lisa Rohanan, who provided this background on indigenous tourism in Australia, what are the issues they are facing and how we can think about SDGs to help these communities. And she provided this case about the indigenous tourism and success stories they had here in Queensland. Then we move to our next speaker, Dr. Freya, who beautifully explained these uh, terms of local authority or local term and even socializing tourism, which help us to have this critical thinking or crit critical lens about you know, tourism development in many places. And it can be applicable both to more developed and less developed nations all around the world. And we had these great uh, questions for, uh, regarding that you know, conversation. And last speaker, Dr. Puan provided uh, fantastic examples from the different cases for different communities in Malaysia. And it was uh, wonderful to hear how they are facing different issues and the strategies they are using, you know, just to probably combat all these negative impacts. Uh, again, it was a wonderful session and I would like to thank everyone, our uh, speakers and everyone who attended the session today. So thank you so much and over to you uh, for the rest of the session. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raymond. What a wonderful session we had just now. Thank you for your moderation. All the speakers for sharing very interesting